Welcome to another segment. I believe this is our third of my reaction series to Bill Cooper's Mystery School Talks. Uh, Bill Cooper was a probably the godfather of the modern conspiracy theory movement. Uh, at one time, I believe he had top secret clearance. Um, he died in a hail of bullets with uh, in a gunfight with federal law enforcement. Um, he, uh, he did extremely thorough research. These so far have been incredibly well researched, but he's coming from a completely different point of view, which is basically that of a Christian right-wing um, conspiracy theorist. And of course, I have a lifelong student of the mysteries. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the mysteries. Um, I, I, and I, I, you know, I would even go so far as to say that the reestablishment of modern mystery schools is absolutely essential um, to the, you know, to the betterment and the empowerment of the human race. And uh, it's something that we're sort of missing is the guidance of a sort of structured. Um, I don't want to say that I want to reinstate hierarchy, uh, but a sort of structured system of learning uh, that integrates a spiritual understanding with that of an understanding of the natural sciences. Um, so, Bill and I are coming from very different places. I would also like to preface this video by saying that if it seems I'm a little bit more defensive of the mysteries in general than the things that Bill is saying might warrant, bear in mind that I am reacting to this in the context of having already viewed a couple of his um, segments of this series. So I kind of know where Bill is coming from. Also, if you pay attention to the tone uh, that he uses, uh, there's, it really speaks a lot more directly, uh, a lot of times than his words do. Uh, and the reason that this bothers me so much is that I, I've literally lived a lifetime, uh, knowing full well that the suppression of the mysteries and, uh, entheogenic plants and the alternate, uh, spiritual systems, uh, that lie outside of the institutionalized religions, uh, the suppression of all of those things has, um, been responsible for the overwhelming majority of the serious problems that mankind has endured over the last couple of centuries. Um, it's, 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 it's very difficult to see someone uh, who has good intentions continuing to uh, promulgate those things. Uh, and, you know, Bill definitely did contribute to uh, the mistrust of the modern mystery schools and uh, th I think that's really unfortunate. Um, on the other hand, I have to say that there is something that I, I, I do agree with Bill about um, that's worthy of noting, and that is that the, the people who are at the top of the eye in the pyramid uh, did evolve beyond the rest of mankind through mystery school training and entheogenic plants. I think he's absolutely correct about that. And that accelerated uh, evolution did allow them to understand how to manipulate uh, their fellow humans and how to emulate the process of nature in order to build empires uh, and uh, to you know mostly I think most significantly uh, to surpass their peers uh, psychologically uh, and so I do agree with Bill that that did happen I, I think one of the Things that we need to keep in our awareness uh, going forward in our human journey is that the expansion of consciousness uh, is just that. And it doesn't necessarily ensure that people are going to be kind and gentle and humble. Um, that's why uh, these practices have been protected. It's part of the reason. Um, obviously, they were not necessarily kept out of the hands of people that would abuse them. So that's the one concession uh, that I wanted to make that, you know, although Bill seems to have the opinion that these things are just overall overtly evil, um, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing that uh, they are tools uh, that can be subject to abuse in the wrong hands. The, the communism and socialism and just a lot of other really crazy things that are really unfortunate because, you know, these, these, this tradition of creating these fraternal, uh, compendiums of uh, the, all of the spiritual traditions and philosophical 
ideas uh, and magical traditions from all over the planet and preserving those traditions uh, the most important parts you know this is absolutely essential um, and it there are certainly uh, a tremendous uh, good that has come from from the mysteries and the rediscovery of uh, entheogenic plants uh, in our European and uh, you know North American culture is something that needs the discipline of the mysteries and so From Tinkerbell to Artie Shaw to George Bush's Thousand Points of Light, America has been mesmerized by stardust since its very inception. And now America is beginning to learn what all these references to the star, the morning star, wish upon a star, stardust, really is all about. Well, <clears throat> that's not really true, I, I, I don't think. Uh... The association, first of all, with the Morning Star and Lucifer is sort of just this crazy thing that came out of nowhere. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the historical Bible. The, the name Lucifer does not even occur in the original Hebrew. Uh, it was just a political opponent of the guy that wrote the book of Exodus. Um, the actual word in Hebrew is Bin Hillel, it's like Howl, Son of Morning, um, not even a reference to the Morning Star. Uh, so that's just sort of this weird thing that modern pop culture, mainstream Christianity has kind of created. Uh, it has no reality to it. I think <clears throat> it's probably closer to the truth to say that we are stardust, uh, we are star stuff, as my Navajo friends um, say. and. And our consciousness is light, which comes to us from a star. And so, intuitively, we all know these things. And artists are people that create a bridge between the conscious and the subconscious mind. So all of these references to stars that he's just so suspicious of, I think are just, you know, just intuitive expressions um, of artists and musicians. And it has absolutely nothing to do with any dark satanic mystery. Something very strange about the classical mysteries, something which attracted people to them and having attracted them made their initiates with very few exceptions permanent devotees. In Egypt, Greece, India, Rome, and a dozen other places and countries, sacred initiations took place in specially prepared sanctuaries, usually in a cave or underground. Priests of the mysteries enjoyed the profound respect of the masses, as well as that of kings and counselors, and in those days there was nothing really secret about it except the initiation rites and the knowledge which they retained for themselves, giving only the exoteric to the people. What were the mysteries? Until relatively recently, and relying upon comparatively scattered fragments such as Apollesius Golden Ass, historians and religious writers had formed an opinion of them which has been shown to be extremely naive, if not outright false. They knew that at the ceremonies symbolical teaching took place, and hence inferred that the mysteries were a relic of the times when academic knowledge was guarded by the very few, and scientific truths such as Pythagorean theorems were given only, and only, to the elect. They knew also that orgiastic drumming and dancing formed a part of many of the rituals and therefore told their readers that this was a degenerate form of religion or a mere excuse for licentiousness. They found that stories of ancient gods and heroes were recited and were sure that the mysteries constituted little more than an underground survival of prehistoric religion, magic, or tribal initiation. It's a little bit painful to listen to his ignorance. Uh, 
when you know really what was happening here is that the predominant religions of the time like Christianity had driven the tribal the traditional uh, practices the ancestral magic and the plant medicine use um, underground where it had to be hidden uh, in order to avoid persecution and um, you know it's a little bit ridiculous to listen to the oppressor and the dominator and the a person that basically is an avatar for this force that has driven humanity into this sort of toxic backwaters um, where, you know, Christianity and Islam and all of these oppressive forces uh, have driven it. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is quite ridiculous um, also uh, to, you know, listen to him talk about these ideas and practices that really form the basis for the religion that he believes. Um, and it's also, I think, important to just take note of the fact that these mystery schools that were Greek and Egyptian and maybe had European roots um, employed all of the same techniques that we see in tribal shamanism, uh, orgiastic drumming and dancing and the use of plant medicines um, and so it does actually seem that there was this universal sort of religion. Um, but it's a, I'm using the word religion uh, very loosely, um, but there was certainly a, a sort of spiritual protocol that was nearly global um, it, it, with, with all of our ancestors throughout the entire world. And the uh, eminent Freemason Albert Pike wrote in Morals and Dogma that in the early stages of man, we had the truth, and wandering along in the darkness, uh, we found error. And I, I think that uh, the great irony here is that Bill here has found error, and he's confusing, he's staring the truth right in the face, and he is perceiving these two uh, you know, his own religion versus the ancient mysteries, um, exactly reversed. I, uh, really interested to see, uh, exactly what he has to say about the process of initiation. I did kind of skim through these, but I wanted it to be a sort of spontaneous reaction. So, um, haven't really heard everything, so let's jump in and see what this is all about. Therefore, told their readers that this was a degenerate form of religion or a mere excuse for licentiousness. They found that stories of ancient gods and heroes were recited and were sure that the mysteries constituted little more than an underground survival of prehistoric religion, magic, or tribal initiation. Or maybe that's exactly what they wanted us to believe, knowing full well that it was false. And, of course, if those who did the writing were members of the mysteries, they would never have allowed the secrets to be revealed to the profane. But times have changed, folks. The study of brainwashing and mind control and conditioning the mind within the past decade or so has helped to lay bare the essence of the mysteries and has answered the riddles which surrounded them. You see, in this process, those who had tried to keep the celebration of the mysteries alive, who had tried to revive them, have been shown up as relying upon the symbolic interpretation alone. And this revelation has been, in its own way, one of the most startling developments of contemporary religion. You see, for almost anyone, for instance, can get away with telling anyone else that he was an Egyptian priest in a former incarnation because there's so very little verifiable material available to prove the reverse. It becomes obvious, though, when you attend a party populated by these nuts, when six people introduce themselves as having been Abraham Lincoln in a past life. But let anyone attempt to celebrate any of the ancient mystery cult's rituals and unless he has a sound idea of how the human mind works, he is likely to escape the criticism of those physiologists who now see in the mysteries an almost open book. Okay, so he's doing a couple of things here that are kind of sneaky and ridiculous. Uh, he's sort of confusing the theosophist or the New Ager 
with a serious student of the mysteries because you know any real initiate of the mysteries is not going to accept that someone is the reincarnation of Abraham Lincoln and there are not parties full of serious mystery school adepts um, anywhere really uh, that would be open to someone like Bill Cooper um, you know so he's he's kind of confusing a pop culture phenomena that's not relevant to the mysteries which is you know new age housewives basically um, and and the top, and the like you know their 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 crowd um, who are the kind of people that you know sit down to meditate hear a voice in their head and they believe that it's uh, who are one of the um, Maitreya or uh, Saint um, Germain uh, you know it, it, it's 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 just the sort of um, parlor game uh, and real students of the mysteries would laugh um, at these people because in the mysteries you spend years and years and years uh, training to distinguish between a voice in your head and genuine intuition or uh, genuine contact with some other form of intelligence and non-human intelligence so that's kind of a cheap shot that he just took and it's kind of just irrelevant bullshit so let us return to a sketch of the conventional knowledge about the mysteries and those of Eleusis celebrated in Greece, the candidate had to undergo fasting or abstinence from certain foods. There were processions with sacred statues carried from Athens to Eleusis. Those who were to be initiated waited for long periods of time outside the hall in the temple where the rites were to be held, building up a tremendous tension of suspense. Eventually, a torchbearer led them within the precincts, usually underground. The ceremonies included a ritualistic meal, one or two dramas, the exhibition of sacred objects, the giving of the word, <laughs> an address by the Hierophant, and oddly enough, closure with the Sanskrit words, Kansha Ampaksha. The elements included the clashing of symbols, tension and a certain degree of debilitation um that was a mispronunciation uh it's Honks om pox and uh there is an excellent little book by alistair crowley uh called Honks om pox that is a, a reference um to this uh and I also wanted to point out that, that uh, the rites of, uh, of Ulysses is one of the mysteries uh, where a drink was consumed. Um, he may not have been aware of this. Um, that was definitely psychoactive, and people like Plato and Socrates and all of these uh, Greek uh, intellectual giants were present at these mysteries. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been conjectured that the reason they were so far ahead of the rest of humanity was the drinks and rites uh, that were um, practiced and consumed at the Eleusinian Mysteries. Um, Plus conditions which were awe-inspiring, strange. The candidate was in the hands of and guided by the priesthood. Other factors were drinking a soporific draught, symbolic sentence of death, whirling around a circle. Initiation ceremonies of secret cults and the mystery type invariably involved tests, sometimes most severe ones. The effect of certain experiences was a carefully worked program of mind training, which is familiar in modern times as that which is employed by certain totalitarian states to condition or reshape the thinking of an individual. Are you listening to me, all you Freemasons out there who think that you're so smart? Yes, Bill, I am listening. And the irony here is that he is once again turning things about on their face um, the conditioning of totalitarian states uh, part of that protocol uh, unless you're talking about a communist nation but certainly in European countries um, you know in South America in the United States uh, 
part of part of that conditioning is religious uh, indoctrination into whatever institutionalized belief system has been adopted for the purposes of controlling the minds of the population to keep them from looking beyond certain boundaries to keep them from making certain types of discoveries to keep them from actually having genuine spiritual experiences by demonizing things like orgiastic drums and psychoactive beverages and so further um, to add injury to insults the uh, consumption of these beverages and the practice of the mysteries actually um, a, 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 one of the main focal points is deprogramming the influence of the uh, institutions um, of the religions uh, we know that psychedelics make the brain more malleable so that uh, old conditioning can be replaced um, by new conditioning and it is true that under some circumstances psychedelics can be used to um, program people very directly because if your brain is in a highly neuroplastic state and you are bombarded with repetitive messages uh, this is actually how I use LSD to quit smoking so it is true that it's possible to abuse the potential power of these medicines um, but the reality is that the liberation from institutionalized uh, beliefs and dogma and religion and um, all of the stuff that he's basically accusing the mysteries of um, you know using to enslave the minds of people uh, the mysteries and the plants that are employed and the practices that are employed are designed to allow you to transcend and escape the kind of um, high mind slave zombie creating religious uh, systems that Bill Cooper uh, himself believes in and advocates so the irony here is absolutely top shelf produces a state in which the mind is pliant enough to have certain ideas implanted ideas which resist a great deal of counter influence this was the secret of the mysteries this and nothing else echoes of such training are to be seen in the rituals of certain secret societies without mystical pretensions which survive to this day now hold on just a second that is the secret and nothing else so all of this shadowy behind the scenes stuff that he's going to spend hundreds of hours like there are literally like 160 hours of this or something um, of these talks so that's the only secret that you can make your mind more pliant that's the big satanic dark secret that and nothing more the truth is that the real power of the mysteries comes from the ability to observe nature and natural phenomena and our own psychology with naked uninfluenced objectivity and to create systems that are based on um, that that raw uh, direct knowledge and observation of why these natural systems work and that's just one element of you know the actual secrets of the mystery so that statement was just completely stupid um, and it even runs contrary to you know if that's the only secret of the mysteries and what are we spending 160 hours um, uncovering terror expectancy drinking and the rest that this fact was known in the past, folks, is evidenced by the words of Aristotle, who was exiled because he was said to have revealed something about the mysteries, and he said this, quote, Those who are being initiated do not so much learn anything as experience certain emotions and are thrown into a special state of mind, unquote. Okay. So let's look at how extreme the contradiction was there. He had just said that the whole point of the mysteries was to make the mind pliant and then to program into the initiates. Uh, in one of the other videos, he says it's, it's communism and socialism and Satanism and all of this stuff. Um, 
So that's completely contradictory. Um, what else did he say? I, I've got to go back just a hair here and see. Who was exiled because he was said to have revealed something about the mysteries. And he said this, quote, those who are being initiated do not so much learn anything as experience certain emotions and are thrown into a special state of mind, unquote. Well, what was this special state? Yeah, so if they're not learning anything, then what is this indoctrination and programming that he's referencing? He's saying that all that happens is that you experience ecstasy. You become unbound from the tethers of... Uh, your normal matrix mind consciousness and you experience the totality of existence um, you know th this is true uh, but again you know this totally runs contrary um, to everything he had just said about how it's a system of indoctrination and programming and you know that clearly is a type of learning well, what was this special state of mind? Folks, it was a plasticity in order that the conditioning might take permanent root. The psychologist William Sargent, the greatest authority on this subject, says in his classic Battle for the Mind, quote, It seems, therefore, that there are common final paths which all individual animals though initial temperamental responses to impose stresses very greatly, must finally take. If only stresses are continued long enough, this is probably the same in human beings, and if so, may help to explain why excitatory drumming, dancing, and continued bodily movement are so much used in such a number of primitive religious groups. The efforts and excitement of keeping the dance in progress for many hours on end should wear down and, if need be, finally subdue even the strongest and most stubborn temperament, such as might be able to survive frightening and exciting talk alone for days or weeks." Unquote. Now, understanding what I just read to you, this quote from Battle for the Mind by William Sargent, can you still say that music plays no part in the conditioning of the mind? That the words in the music is not being entrapped by the subconscious of those young people who dance for hours listening to this music? If so, I think you'd better rethink that position. It's pretty incredible to see the career of those forces that they know will undo them and liberate humanity uh, from the uh, slavery, basically, that they uh, have, have, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> religion uh, comes from the Latin religio, which is to bind, right, to bind the mind to servitude. Um, And, you know, another thing that I feel compelled to mention at this juncture is that it's, if you haven't watched the other two segments of this, you really should at least watch the last one, second one that I did. I think it's called, uh, I'll put a card uh, here, um, a link. Because it, he really, really describes in extraordinarily vivid uh, detail, um, and ex extremely, yeah, in, 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 in very vivid detail, how Christianity was just a metaphorical or allegorical simplification of the mysteries and our understanding of light and consciousness. Um, it, that, you know, light reflecting on water was just, that, that, that Jesus walking on water was just light reflecting on the ocean. You know, that, 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 that it's just, it's so obvious. And the fact that he can even still believe in it after subjecting himself to all of this truth, um, it really, really speaks volumes to the level of indoctrination uh, and the power uh, that this stuff has over people. Um, I mean, he is consistently 
staring the truth in the eyes and just completely reversing the narratives um, with the, the real actual uh, function of, of an effects of Christianity uh, versus these authentic systems like the mysteries and uh, the tribal practices that are related all around the world. Arm of mind control, brainwashing. Dr. Sargent notes that Chinese experiments in mass excitation, breaking down and reconditioning, are based on the same physiological principles as religious conversion and also group and individual psychotherapy treatments. Folks, these include the application of tension, fear, anxiety, conflict to the point where the subjects are uncertain. And in this state, suggestibility is increased and the old pattern of behavior is disrupted. The fact that the devotees of the mysteries were thoroughly conditioned to them and felt that they were important in their lives is seen in much historical evidence. Even in the fourth century of the Christian era, the Greeks were insisting that they, quote, would consider life unbearable if they were not allowed to celebrate those most sacred mysteries which unite the human race, unquote. Now, the work of those who have pointed out the function of the mysteries as mind training and conditioning has, of course, evoked no answer from those who still think that the rituals are mere symbolic representations of knowledge or of facts. I don't think anyone thinks that. Um, but, again, I just I, I feel like I should reiterate that uh, he has said that the mysteries had no purpose but to keep the mind pliant. Um, and now we're back on this theme of indoctrination and rigidity, which is exactly the opposite of a pliant mind. Uh, and I, you know, I think that the uh, Romans that he cited that are were terrified that they one day wouldn't be able to practice their mysteries. Um, I, you know, it's not difficult to see to have foresight about where human mind or human culture uh, would be taken uh, without this. Uh, Pliancy, uh, without the plasticity uh, that is endowed upon the human mind uh, by these plans and practices. I'd admit this simply because they would be admitting their own foolishness and stupidity in the process. So they will resist at all costs and continue to go to their meetings, for to do otherwise would be to confront their own fallibility. And in human nature, that is one of the most difficult things for any individual to do. Wouldn't questioning your religion and not having absolute faith in Christianity, regardless of the fact that you can see all of these earlier influences, um, to the extent that you know you're making hours and hours and hours of video describing it? Uh, wouldn't the ability to question your own religion fall under this category of recognizing your own infallibility? This, it's really crazy to listen to this. Um, and it's not like this guy is singular. This is pretty much standard. Um, the psychological gymnastics that he's doing, the cognitive dissonance, the selective perception, uh, you know, this is a worthy study uh, to really, I mean, this is like the most explicit example I've ever seen of, and probably the most extreme, of a person that is able to maintain their indoctrination and uh, remain in a comatose brainwashed state, even when they're educated uh, with the information that should dissolve the mind-forged manacles that have been placed on them. <clears throat> I realize that. It's interesting to note, folks, that the ecstasy which is produced by excitatory methods and is followed by manipulation of the mind is still sought by members of many secret cults who are aware of the scientific explanation. You see, irregardless, even when they know this, they still seek it out because for them it fulfills some terrible need way down deep inside their gut. 
The reaction is that the experience may well be induced by physical methods, but in spite of that, and this is what they say, quote, it is nothing less than actual spiritual communion with a supernatural power, unquote. This is the point at which scientists and mystics cannot agree. The mystic feels sure that he has experienced something sublime, and who's to say that they haven't? For if you have not experienced it, you have no basis upon which to make a decision. But to experience it is to put yourself in a position to be controlled by others. So we are in a quandary now. How do we explore this? We most certainly are in a quandary now. The first thing that comes to mind immediately is that if this mystical experience is... Uh, you know such a danger to people and it puts you in a position to be controlled by others what is Saint John of the Cross being swept up to heaven uh, where he was shown things of which it's not lawful to utter and, and what are we to make of the experience of Christians encountering Jesus and letting him into their heart uh, you know I this level of cognitive dissonance is really just mind-boggling um, and it's it's also you know really sort of reinforces uh, this suspicion that I've always had that that Christianity was sort of engineered to demonize all of the true paths to higher consciousness to higher awareness to ecstasy to real spiritual experience and you know, his demonization of all of the effective tools um, that result in those experiences that actually liberate one from cultural indoctrination, from religious indoctrination, and leave a person pretty much impervious to undue influence from others. Um, autonomy is enhanced and increased by the psychedelic experience uh, and the practices of the mysteries. Um, they are all the objective of all of them is the same uh, to enter into this this state of enhanced neuroplasticity and neurogenesis and whether you're talking about meditation and pranayama or path working on the Kabbalistic tree of life or the consumption of psychedelics hopefully all of those things in combination study of the natural sciences you know all of these things to varying degrees and particularly hand in hand, which is the approach of the mysteries, they result in reduced trauma. Uh, that alone is going to make a person less susceptible to being dominated and influenced by other people. So, you know, the the ludicrousness of labeling the uh, mystical or ecstatic experience as a negative influence that 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 makes a person subject to conditioning. And, um, and influence from malevolent forces. I mean, I don't know that you could take a, a stupider position than that. It really is up there with the, the dumbest things that I've ever heard in my life. How do we explore this? The scientist tells the mystic that it is an illusion. He just simply will not believe it. The situation reminds one of the time when someone produced the soul of a departed relative to tell a spiritualist that there was no life after death. <laughs> Although this is alleged to have happened in Ireland, one can visualize it taking place easily enough in the mutually heated atmosphere of scientist versus mystic anywhere in the world. The orgiastic side of the mysteries also has a place in the sphere of psychology. The catharsis, or the cleansing of the mind, which the secret cult of the Cathari experienced after ecstasy, is paralleled by the modern therapist's procedure in bringing his patient to a state of excitement and then collapse before implanting what he considers more suitable ideas in the mind. Christianity, of course, has not been behind in its use of the mystery system for initiates, for it was not until A.D. 692 that every believer was ordered to be admitted to the worship of the Christians. Following the period when it was thought advisable to celebrate certain parts of worship in secret, 
You see, Christianity in the beginning was a secret society itself. And the correct name for it was the Friendly Open Secret Society, although in the beginning there was nothing open about it. I don't think there's any record anywhere in the world of early Christianity being referred to as the Friendly Open Secret Society. I think that is just something that he made up. Um, and I think it's also uh, worth considering that uh, what I think Christianity did with the mystery school techniques is they L. Ron Hubbarded it. Uh, basically, L. Ron Hubbard's method was to reverse the system of Freemasonry, which is one of the mystery schools. Or really, it's a um, <clears throat> a sort of a fraternity that has tasked themselves with the preservation um, and the syncretization of uh, all of the different mystery traditions under one roof, um, sort of uniting of the great <clears throat> universal um, teachings of the ages. Uh, and what L. Ron Hubbard did with it is he, he, he created a system where you give the initiate the most useful and important tools in the beginning, and as they pay more and more money to get greater and greater secrets, give up more and more control, um, the secrets become more and more ridiculous until at the end, after you have paid, you know, a half a million dollars or something, uh, and spent years of your life working towards this, you're told that aliens came here and the evil ones were thrown into the volcanoes in Hawaii and a little packet of evil that came out of them went into the monkeys and then they evolved into humans and that's where we get evil from. So. He reversed the system, whereas in the mysteries, you got progressively more and more powerful information and knowledge and secrets. They flipped it around so that you get the useful stuff in the beginning and then you get the... It's just garbage from there on in. It's like bait to bring you in. Um, so there was some of that, but also I think that the... Uh, as he's about to describe... Um, there is also this element of convincing people that they're too stupid to understand what the mysteries of Christianity really are, and therefore you should abandon skepticism and critical thinking and just uh, accept everything on faith and don't think too much about it. So, um, I mean, it's interesting that he acknowledged that Christianity employed some of the techniques of the mystery schools, but what they really did just as they perverted the original knowledge into the myth of Christ, uh, they also abused the techniques of uh, revelation and uh, the hierarchy, uh, hierarchical system uh, that protected the, the profane from, um, from this knowledge. ...of this survive in such customs as that of the Greek Orthodox Church where the priest celebrates divine worship behind a curtain, which is only taken away during the elevation of the host. Quote, since at that moment the worshipers prostrate themselves and are not supposed to see the holy sacrament, unquote. The reason given for the secrecy of the practice of the Christian cult gives a clue in explaining that the celebrant must be prepared by expectation. Saint Augustine laid down that secrecy was essential because the mysteries of Christianity were incomprehensible to human intellect and should not be derided by the uninitiated. Secondly, because this secret produced greater veneration for the rites. Thirdly, that the holy curiosity of those to be initiated into the experience of Christianity should be increased in order that they might attain to a perfect knowledge of the faith. And to tell you quite frankly, folks, in my study of mind control, the Christian church would swell well beyond any conception or imagination of what their numbers could be if they had continued their secrecy. St. Basil, the Spiritu Sancto, uh, cap, let me see, that's uh, the 17th, that's a writing, folks, tells how the fathers of the church, quote, were well instructed to preserve the veneration of the mysteries in silence. Okay, so uh, something that he just said really hit a nerve, um, that if the Christian church had maintained its secrecy, 
they would be more powerful than we could ever imagine. Um, I think he may have said something about that earlier. Uh, wouldn't it, it? Wouldn't just being ambassadors and avatars of, or wouldn't being avatars and ambassadors of the Most High God take care of that for you? Um, wouldn't they have a, a protocol that was divinely inspired? that would allow them to achieve whatever it was that their all-powerful God had assigned to them as their inheritance of their faith. Um, you know, there really almost has to be a, 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 de a, a deliberate effort to maintain ignorance um, in order to for him to talk about this stuff and not ask these questions. Or how could it be proper publicly to proclaim in writing the doctrine of those things which no unbaptized person may so much as look upon, unquote. Now this all sounds silly to us today, but believe me folks, there is nothing silly about it. And if it were practiced today as it was then, the Christian church would be more powerful than you could possibly conceive. Now remember, this is the results of our research. I myself consider myself to be a Christian and that I follow the teachings, the words of Christ in my daily life, not the dogma of any human intellect and should not be derided by the unanimous for initiates. For it was not until AD 692 that every believer was ordered to be admitted to the worship of the Christians, cults who are aware of the scientific explanation. You see, irregardless, even when they know this, they still seek it out. Because for them. And who's to say that they haven't? For if you have not experienced it, you have no basis upon which to make a decision. But to experience it is to put yourself in a position to be controlled by others. So we are in a quandary now. Almost certainly at a quandary. Um, How do we explore this? The scientist tells the mystic that it is an illusion. He just simply will not believe it. The situation reminds one of the time when someone produced the soul of a departed relative to tell a spiritualist that there was no life after death. <laughs> Although this is alleged to have happened in Ireland, one can visualize it taking place easily enough in the mutually heated atmosphere of scientists versus mystic anywhere in the world. The orgiastic side of the mysteries also has a place in the sphere of psychology. The catharsis, or the cleansing of the mind, which the secret cult of the cathari experienced after ecstasy, is paralleled by the modern therapist's procedure in bringing his patient to a state of excitement and then collapse before implanting what he considers more suitable ideas in the mind. Christianity, of course, has not been behind in its use of the mystery system for initiation. Interestingly, that last bit about the uh, techniques of psychotherapy, um, and in this case it was uh, psychology that Dr. Timothy Leary was referencing, but that was basically his issue with psychology as well, that you weren't really working towards the resolution of these problematic experiences from the past, traumas and the like. Um, it, it was really just designed to uh, trade the psychologist's uh, set of mental games for another, for the patient's set. Um, so it wasn't any real progress, it was just a different set of games. It's, for it was not until AD 692 that every believer was ordered to be admitted to the worship of the Christians. Following the period when it was thought advisable to celebrate certain parts of worship in secret. You see, Christianity in the beginning was a secret society itself. And the correct name for it was the Friendly Open Secret Society. All I think that it's almost certain that this uh, friendly, open, secret society um, is totally a fabrication of bills. I don't think there's any indication that Christianity was ever called the open, friendly, secret society. It's just... 
Well, in the beginning, there was nothing open about it. Traces of this survive in such customs as that of the Greek Orthodox Church, where the priest celebrates divine worship behind a curtain, which is only taken away during the elevation of the host. Quote, since at that moment the worshipers prostrate themselves and are not supposed to see the holy sacrament, unquote. The reason given for the secrecy of the practice of the Christian cult gives a clue in explaining that the celebrant must be prepared by expectation. St. Augustine laid down that secrecy was essential because the mysteries of Christianity were incomprehensible to human intellect and should not be derided by the uninitiated. Secondly, because this secret produced greater veneration for the rites. Thirdly, that the holy curiosity of those to be initiated into the experience of Christianity should be increased in order that they might attain to a perfect knowledge of the faith. And to tell you quite frankly, folks, in my study of mind control, the Christian church would swell well beyond any conception or imagination of what their numbers could be if they had continued their secrecy. Um, I would suggest that if the Christian church were truly ambassadors and even avatars of the Most High God, that secrecy would not be required, that their God could um, connect them with the uh, faith that is the inheritance of their faith. Um, seems a bit ridiculous uh, that he would say that. and. It also seems worth mentioning that the secrecy in, in Christianity uh, serves a very different purpose um, than the secrecy in the mystery schools. And that uh, the suggestion that the profane need to remain profane um, and not understand uh, the true practices and the true spiritual reality uh, I think that this is an extremely poignant um, elucidation of, of the fundamental problem with Christianity, that it is actually designed to, uh, to inhibit spiritual experience and access to states of higher consciousness and revelation uh, that, you know, and, and to me it's the greatest blasphemy possible to create what is supposed to be a spiritual system, uh, the real covert intention of which is to subvert actual spiritual growth and experience. It is probably the evilest trick that has ever been pulled on, on mankind. Saint Basil, the Spiritu Sancto, uh, Cap, let me see, that's uh, the 17th. That's a writing, folks tells how the fathers of the church, quote, were well instructed to preserve the veneration of the mysteries in silence. For how could it be proper publicly to proclaim in writing the doctrine of those things which no unbaptized person may so much as look upon, unquote. Now this all sounds silly to us today, but believe me, folks, there is nothing silly about it, and if it were practiced today as it was then, the Christian church would be more powerful than you could possibly conceive. Now remember, this is the results of our research. I myself consider myself to be a Christian and that I follow the teachings, the words of Christ in my daily life, not the dogma of any church, not the preaching of any minister or priest, but simply and only the words of Christ. Seated upon the foundation of that which God gave us early in our history, the moral code called the Ten Commandments, as they were originally given to Moses, and not as they were changed by man in the form of the Pope. The origin of mystery ceremonies seems to be India or at least the place and time when the Brahmin priesthood started its initiations. The ceremonies were based upon the Hindu myths, but the procedure followed in training the aspirant is strikingly similar in Egypt, and Egypt 
profoundly influenced Greece. Now what's left out here, and the reason it's usually left out, is because any mention or discussion of the Babylonian mysteries or the Babylonian religion is usually met with much criticism and derision by those who believe that it was a terrible institution. The mysteries definitely came from the East, and the East in the mysteries still survives today. When one Freemason greets another and he's not sure if he's really a Freemason, he'll ask him if he's a traveler or if he's traveling or if he is a fellow traveler. All I might add were the same code of identification used by the Communist Party in this country because communism and the mysteries are the same entity. Well, if I had... I, I thought I had heard the dumbest things that I would ever hear in my entire life already stated in this um, talk, but communism and the mysteries being the same entity or force or whatever he just said, uh, this guy is a fucking moron. Um, and it, as this goes on, it's getting harder and harder for me to um, sit through it, honestly. Uh, you know, I, I do think it's a good opportunity for someone who is an advocate of the mysteries um, and that respects the mysteries uh, to respond to a lot of this. And I, I, I really just think it's absolutely tragic that um, there are people out there that think that this guy knew what he was talking about um, and, you know, really took him to heart uh, because I, I think it, it's really limiting your the potential for your experiences in life uh, and limiting your your growth um, this this stuff is is extremely uh, toxic on on the soul level um, but what he was just referencing there has is more to do with the Templars uh, and the uh, the step and grip and other secret handshakes are really the method that it is is used um, for for initiates to to recognize each other as are socialism and the mysteries when they meet and this exchange takes place the one being queried if he is indeed a member of the mystery religion will say yes I'm a traveler to which the first or the inquirer will respond with, where are you going or where are you traveling? From where to where? And the answer will be from west to east. For the east is the position of the rising sun, where the knowledge comes from. You see, for an early history, it certainly can be proven to have come from the East. And the sun was the symbol of the intellect. It began by being sim the symbol of the unseen God of the universe. So, uh, that was remarkable um, to hear him say, because it's so close to one of the real, true, fundamental secrets of the mysteries, and one of the most impressive revelations um, that are offered uh, by the, the mysteries, but it's not that they're offered just by these mysteries. I, I think that any seeker eventually realizes the connection, connection between consciousness and light. And the sun is indeed uh, the source of our consciousness and our knowledge and our experience. Um, and so it's, it's not just a symbol of being the source of those things, but it is quite literally the source of those things. And slowly transformed into the symbol of the intellect, the light, Osiris, Ra, Lucifer. Prayer, fasting, and study were the first requirements when the Indian candidate prepared himself for the trials which were before him. All of this, folks, originated in Babylon at the dawn of civilization. 
For the actual sight of the great gods and for the final word or teaching which would be implanted in his mind when it had become sufficiently prepared to receive it. And if the weather was cold, he would have to sit in the snow or rain naked. In the torrid heat, he sat in the full blaze of the sun with four fires built around him to give additional heat. And this was the first part of the undertaking. While he repeated prayers and repetitions, which included the invocation for his complete conversion. This latter concentration, folks, upon the desires of the candidate is applied in more than one of the mysteries. Some of the initiation ceremonies were cruel and painful. Okay, so he just stated that initiation required you to sit in the snow naked um, in the middle of the desert in Egypt, I guess. Or Babylonia, Syria, um, and a whole bunch of other places that he named that where it doesn't snow. And then he also said that you had to sit in the blazing sun with four fires burning around you. And that was the first part of initiation, sitting in the snow and then sitting in the, in the blazing heat in the fire. So assuming that winter and summer are six months apart, how exactly did these two trials or tribulations occur as the first part of anything if they're six months apart? And was the initiate taken up to a mountain in Tibet and then brought down into the desert and envy? What exactly what? Um... So, you know, I. I think there are a lot of instances here where he doesn't even bother to stop and think, does this make any sense? Is this even coherent? Coupled with the word, which is given during the ceremonies, it means that the power of suggestion is being applied continuously and should penetrate into the mind at every moment when it is able to receive it. This period of dedication was succeeded by one in which he visited the underground cave of initiation. And when it wasn't in a cave, it was in a tomb or a crypt, such as the pyramids of Egypt, which were never tombs of pharaohs, but were from the beginning until the end of their use. They were temples of initiation. I don't understand why he says that. I mean, there are bodies in the tombs, which is what makes them tombs by definition. So to say that they were never tombs, never means ever. And there were bodies found in these rooms, especially considering the fact that there were temple rooms in the pyramids as well. What is the purpose of this? It's it's just sort of a, a psychological game, I think, where he is attempting to get credibility in the minds of the listeners by just sort of fabricating things. And they're just sort of injected here and there into the stream of information so that, you know, you, you kind of move on to another topic before you really have a chance to stop and think, like, wait a minute, what is what was that word salad it doesn't mean anything it's clearly untrue all it takes is a split second of analysis um it's it's interesting to consider whether he is is doing this deliberately if he's really thought like you know how do i make shit up uh to gain credibility without anyone noticing you know what i mean like did he deliberately strategize to mislead people um or was he just kind of insane and just spouting all of this stuff? Um, it's really remarkable to see how much solid investigative, you know, research this guy did uh, while still being completely and totally full of shit. Uh, it's an extraordinary feat. Um, but as we say in the mystery schools, everything contains its contradictions. So I guess that was um that's well done mr cooper passing through a tunnel of complete darkness the initiate emerged into the cavern where three priests dressed as gods awaited him in resplendent 
and intimidating array. After being addressed and partaking in the oration of prayers, the initiate walked rapidly around the temple several times, this called circumnambulation, and was then carried through several subterranean and unlit caves. During this time, there were wails, wails, screams, and shouts from every side, while illuminated specters and other horrors abounded. At the end of this terrible experience, the aspirant came to two doors, which, when thrown open to the sound of the sacred conch trumpet, the conch, folks, is a shell, revealed a scene of brilliance and glory. This hall was full of every delight in the form of pictures, music, and perfume. The initiate walked to an altar in the room where he was again harangued and presented with his sevenfold cord which marked his passing through the initiation. Now if we compare these proceedings with those which were said to be carried out among the Egyptians, the parallelism is startling even today. The candidate was taken to a well which he had to descend until he came to a tunnel. Torch in hand, he passed through a door, which closed with a resounding noise, as if never to be opened again. He was met by frightful figures, which offered him a last chance of going back. Then he passed through a fire, swam through a dangerous underground stream, and as soon as he reached a door and touched a ring to open it, a blast of air blew out the lamp, which gave the only available light. Some type of machine swung him over a bottomless pit, and just as he was on the point of exhaustion, an ivory door opened, and he found himself on the threshold of the resplendent temple of Isis. Here the priests received him into their company. After this series of tests, he had to undergo fasting and what would nowadays be called indoctrination, before he could be considered completely initiated into even the first degree. The foregoing experiences were followed by the higher degrees, those of Serapis and Osiris. And in the process, the wives of the priests would tease him and conjole him and try to get him to make love to them. And if he successfully resisted, then he could say that he had passed all the tests. Okay, so uh, what he was describing with the um, descent in the well and um, the various rooms, um, those are sephirot on the Tree of Life uh, that the candidate is passing through. Uh, there's an excellent book uh, written by Aleister Crowley called Conk's Own Pox. Um, and actually, it's not entirely excellent. There are some... Um, plays that are just pointless uh, but there's a story about a young fairy princess who uh, ascends the um, Kabbalistic tree of life or a young girl who ascends the Kabbalistic tree of life guided by her fairy prince who is a representative of her higher self um, and so that's what that that process was uh, and it was it's a, a physical journey through the allegorical tree of life closed with a resounding noise as if it and just as he was on the point of exhaustion an ivory door opened and he found himself it is needless to outline the beliefs and methods used in the chinese japanese blew out the lamp which gave the only available light even this blowing out of the lamp that he described is uh, that is representative of uh, light, which uh, came through the veils of negative existence, Ein Sof, Ein Sof Hour, uh, and into the crown, illuminating the crown chakra, basically, um, and then passing through all the separate when it reaches Malkut, which is the foundation or matter, the light has crystallized into matter. So this blowing out of the lamp um, functions uh, in sort of dual symbolism as the death of the initiate, um, also his arrival in Malkut, um, and
And of course, the emergence of the initiate is the rebirth. Um, the idea that we are resurrected into a new life after uh, having a, a, some sort of mystical or religious experience is pretty ubiquitous. Christianity has it. Uh, the mystery certainly had it. The idea of uh, transmigration from Pythagoras and, and, and the Buddhists uh, is sort of another version of this, but it, it is pretty ubiquitous. Some type of machine swung him over a bottomless pit, and just as he was on the point of exhaustion, an ivory door opened, and he found himself on the threshold of the resplendent temple of Isis. Here the priests received him into their company. After this series of tests, he had to undergo fasting and what would nowadays be called indoctrination before he could be considered completely initiated into even the first degree. The foregoing experiences were followed by the higher degrees, those of Serapis and Osiris. And in the process, the wives of the priests would tease him and conjole him and try to get him to make love to them. And if he successfully resisted, then he could say that he had passed all the tests. But if he succumbed to their advances, he was not considered worthy. It is needless to outline the beliefs and methods used in the Chinese, Japanese, South American, and other mysteries, because while the legends which are inculcated may vary in some way, they are all essentially and basically the same. The training hardly varies at all. The real mystery of the mysteries, folks, is how and when man first discovered the use of certain procedures to condition other men and thus rule them and control them, and whether the discovery was instantaneous or gradual, or simultaneous or at different times and places. But one cannot date doctrines as one can archaeological finds by radioactive carbon dating. And so you've reached another milestone in your education into the mysteries. Miseducation? I, I don't know that I can recall a single instance of a government uh, endorsing orgiastic drumming, trances, hallucinogenic plants, um, or any element of the mysteries. In fact, much of these things have been demonized and outlawed uh, in order to protect a society that has already successfully been indoctrinated, brainwashed, and Christianized. Um, again, this is remarkable um, to sort of see what goes on in the minds of the enemy, I guess, is increasingly how this feels. And this program has only half completed. And again, I must remind you that we have just begun for we are essentially covering 6,000 years of the history of a hidden religion known simply as the Mysteries. To Christians, it is Mystery Babylon. To others, it is called the Invisible College. In all cases, it belongs to those who consider themselves in possession of the only truly mature minds and thus the only ones capable of knowing certain advancements in technology, sociology, and many, many other things. They call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages. All right, guys, we're going to stop it there. We're about halfway through, so there's going to be a part two uh, to this uh, single segment. So we'll have Initiation 1, Initiation 2 before we move on to maybe I was thinking the worship of Lucifer um, is the next segment of Bills that we'll have a look at. I'm sure I'll have plenty to take issue with there as well. Um, so do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe. This is a demonetized channel. So um, all of our support comes from our community. 
Uh, thank you so much for watching, 